Good evening. This is Strange Love, and I'm your host, Cami Chaos. Welcome, babies. Good evening, and welcome to a very untraditional episode of Strange Love Live. Uh, this is our tech edition for the evening. And in case you can't tell from the very loud noise coming from beneath us, we're broadcasting from the dupe above Backspace uh, at the Cyborg Camp pre-party. And our guest tonight is Amber Case. Welcome to the Cyborg Camp pre-party at the dupe. (laughs) Thank you all for coming out. You've been a wonderful crowd, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks. It's great to have a cyborg camp in a tech company in the heart of (laughs) Portland, Oregon's old town, Chinatown, doors to my right, and also above Backspace, where everyone hangs out. We have sponsors to thank, of course. Yay, sponsors. We have uh, Pelotonics, who's not from Portland, but is going to be an honorary Portland citizen tomorrow. And uh, aboutus.org with uh, great, amazing people with cyborgian stuff coming out of their ear. And uh, Iterasi, of course, who helps you save your pages so that you can go back to them and they don't get erased by the torrential dynamicism of the internet. And Inverge, the creative convergence conference that shows us what we can be in the future and how technology will show us the way and <laughs> agent HR recruiting yes you too can be employed by a Cyborgian firm <laughs> and Maker Lab the new media prototyping laboratory <laughs> Maker Lab holds Sunday hack sessions with beer live performances and a whole heck of a lot of computing materials show up or be left behind <laughs> And also, Silicon Florist, bringing us the news before we know it's news. <laughs> because Silicon Florist is awesome, and you should read it all the time. Because there's news there all the time. All the time. And Blaze Streaming, who is bringing this to the interwebs. Yeah, big thanks to Blaze Streaming. You have multiple camera Joe angles on Multiple cameras. These, these great uh, towering devices are are bringing our message to the world. Yeah. Also, Vadoop, who backwards is Putin. <laughs> Thank you for being the greatest OpenID provider since the dawning of OpenID. And a gracious, gracious host for the uh, pre-party for Cyborg Camp. Your inebriated experience is brought to you by Widmere Brewing Company. <laughs> Thank you, Widmere, who gave us all this lovely beer. And also, bacon. Mmm, bacon. I think the band just stopped. Oh my gosh, we should talk quickly talk while the quickly. band is not playing. Yes, if you're hearing booming in the background, it's because there's a band below us. And if you're hearing talking in the background, it's because we're not, it's not like the four people studio audience in our basement. We've got a room full of lovely people. Hello, lovely people. Cool people. Give it up for Hello. Cyborg Camp Free Party. Woo! And, and then we have the lovely Amber Case. Amber, why did you want to do Cyborg Camp? So I was sitting there working at my job, and suddenly someone said, you need to come up to Vancouver, BC. And I said, well, I can't go on a trip unless there's a conference. <laughs> and they said, well, why don't you have a Cyborg Camp? And of course, this was broadcast to someone with 4,000 followers. Wasn't and this all over Twitter? This was all over Twitter. Yeah. And within four hours, there had been a wiki formed, and sponsors, and everything had been organized. And I looked at the tweet stream, and I said, wow, I have to make this thing, because people are interested in cyborgs very much so. So, um, And with the help of everyone, uh, everything came together, and we're going to have a cyborg camp with very interesting speakers about very interesting things, hopefully. So the original date for Cyborg Camp was moved because somebody had to go speak at MIT. Yeah, well, it was supposed to be on December or November 21st and 22nd, mm-hmm. and I got an email from Josh Green, who'd spoken at Inverge, and he said, every year I hold this conference called the Futures of Entertainment, and would you like to come out and speak? 
and we'll fly you out to MIT and you can speak. And I said, oh crap, cyborg camp's on that day. Yeah. So I said, well, if I reschedule it, it will be okay. And on the web, if you do a 301 redirect, you redirect all the traffic from one place to another. Mm-hmm. So I was like, wow, I have to do a, a people redirect where I'm directing people from one event time to another. And I thought it'd be really difficult, but uh, it turned out okay. Yeah, it turned out really well. So, yeah. How, how many people are going to be there tomorrow, do you know? 115. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's a good crowd at Cube Space. It is a good crowd. It's, it's not too much and not too little. It's I guess that means you guys get to get the fancy food. Yeah, we get the fancy food. <laughs> We're going to have um, Greek food by Nicholas's Greek food. That's worth the ten dollars admission. <laughs> yeah, it is. You yeah, know, hopefully. <laughs> if you even don't like cyborgs, right? Yeah. Getting the Nicholas food is worth the uh, price of entry. Right, right. So I think sometimes cyborgs kind of get a bad rap. So maybe we should talk about that for a moment, because when I think of cyborgs, the first thing that comes to mind is a giant floating cube or the Terminator. Right. Well, giant floating cubes and Terminators are one aspect of our psychological conception of, of cyborgs. But in reality, anytime you're in communication with a non-human object, you're a cyborg. So I'm using this container as my non-human ally to uh, hold this drink for me because my hand holding this beer would just be a terrible time. Wait a minute, after hours comes after this segment. Right, good point. <laughs> uh, barley wheat. Uh, <laughs> But, um, oh, your hat is holding your hair in for you. Right. Yeah. But then um, if I use glasses, I'm a cyborg. If I use a computer, I'm helping craft that computer and how it will be in the future. I say, I don't like this piece of software, and that piece of software doesn't work in the future. It doesn't get enough supporters. Uh-huh. But if I say I do like the piece of software, I'm helping that software to reproduce itself in the future. So in a way, I'm helping to create software by being in human computer interaction with it. So do you think there's going to come a time where cyborgs are what we envision them to be? I mean, and I don't mean in a, nest, in a bad way. I don't mean, in, you know, I'm going to hunt you down and kill you. I'm a cyborg or, you know, I'm going to assimilate you. Do you think there's going to become a time when we've got implants and maybe, um, you know, appendages and, and people are becoming more cybernetic? I mean, we can think back to cyberpunk when I used to role play when I was a kid. Do you think that, when do you think that's a conceivable thing? Well, I think we have already these things, like we have these cell phones and everything, and they're yeah. detached from us. Correct. But yet we hold them in our hand as if they're attached to us, and we, we keep them on ourselves as if they've always been there. Yeah. So we're already kind of melding. The distance between action that we take to get to a social conclusion or to get to anything is getting smaller and smaller. And if we have to get really close to the technology in order for that distance to increasingly get small, then we'll probably get weird implants and things like that. But there will be some sort of excuse for it. For instance, it will become like awesome, or it will be advertised or something yeah. like that. And in some ways it will become necessary. Like the fact that right now we have to hunch over our computers, and it's awkward, and it sucks. Yeah. But in the future, the computers will kind of work with how we are. So if they're well designed, we won't have to hunch over them. It's the ultimate in ergonomics. Right, yeah. They'll just conform to how we work. And yeah. they'll understand the way in which we move in our lives. And then we won't have to worry about hunching over. They'll just be on us and we'll be able to connect when we need to. Instead of having to open something up, set it on a table, check for Wi-Fi access, and then finally connect for like one measly email that's really important. Yeah, beloved and cursed Wi-Fi access. Right. How you trouble me? Well, uh, you know, here's the thing I always think about when we really ha- hit cyborg nirvana, and that is now uh, I've got this really, really um, cool and easy uh, messaging system and social system called Twitter. And if I can just if I can just throw that in my glasses and and just have that heads up display and see what's going on immediately and then you know having the option to respond because you don't always respond to Twitter but you could be out and about and finding out what your social network is doing in those very brief messages 
that will be, I think, one of the big inflection points. I think it'll also be a lot of people running into doors and windows and stuff without looking, but, you know, that there's that me. too. <laughs> well, it's funny because Steve Mann has been doing this since 1981. He, um, he grew up in Toronto, but he went to MIT, and he decided that he wanted to have wearable computers. So he made all these crazy apparatus that were just like these big <laughs> pieces of you know, metal, and he actually had to put like silver stuff in his hair to conduct like electricity oh, wow. and to connect to like a Wi-Fi signal. And he carried batteries for um, computers and everything on himself like day after day. And so when he goes to the supermarket and he doesn't like an advertisement, he can use his glasses to block something out. Or when he was sitting around a campfire, um, everyone realized they didn't have any ghost stories to tell. And he checked the internet with his little glasses and got a ghost story and told wow. it to people around the fire. And he said, I don't have to go to my computer. I have the internet right here with me in my glasses. And it looks just very normal. I'm not sure if that woo was for the glasses or no. because someone had a great show at the I think they're, or Yeah, they're playing pool over yeah. there. Yeah, exactly. This is a great party. Um, you were you were talking about MIT. Uh, you were just there like what two two and a half weeks ago. Yeah, or so. yeah. So tell us what you were doing over there and what uh, you were participating in. Yeah. So I spoke on a panel about the future of social media, and basically it was about how to communicate with with people and how to communicate with them in a way that wasn't just a one way channel, where you were actually adding value to their group and their social situation. Because if you didn't add value, they would just ignore you. And, um, and on the way there, I, I went to the media lab and I saw a gesture recognition software. And it was called GTalk. And it was initially a prototype developed for Minority Report. And of course, everyone knows the scene of Minority Report where everyone's moving everything around. So the prototype was actually made into reality by this guy at MIT's media lab. And so he could push data and pull data as if you, like you would on an iPhone. Mm -hmm. But he didn't have to actually touch the screen. He'd be across the room from it. And so I got to try on these gloves. They had the Johnny Mnemonic gloves. Yeah, yeah, it was great. And um, it was extremely smooth. It took about 12 cameras to do it. Oh my God. And but they were little tiny cameras. Yeah. And they were placed all around the room. And you could actually touch data from across the room and, and move it around. And then you could grab something. It was gestural, so. If you went like this, you could randomize the images, and if you like pushed the images with like fly it's away. just like Johnny Mnemonic. I'm sorry. It's, yeah, it it's was... just like that scene where he's all jacked in and he's like, exactly. Yeah, that does nothing for people who can't <laughs> see me, but still. Right. So <laughs> it was funny because you know these people that I met were tasked with the the actual task of creating the future uh -huh. instead of. You know, we all get it in this kind of um, out of the way way where we have a movie where we can't even touch the screen or see the people or interact with them or use the technology. We see that these fantastic devices, but yet the people at MIT are actually creating them so that we can use them in the future. And, you know, they're the only people doing it. Like, there's very few elsewhere that are doing the same things that people are doing. And so it's really epic, you know, it's like they have a bug in their code and, like, that makes it so that none of us can do something, you know, so they have to fix it. And yeah. they kind of have a commitment to like the community of people who would really like to actually be able to move their data like this instead of move it like that. I think it's really interesting that you point out they have a commitment to the community and it's not, and they do, it's true. It used to be, a lot of technology was very self-involved and it's grown to the point, maybe this is part of the cyborgianness of it, is that when you're working in something in technology, it is a commitment to the community. Everybody's writing on, you know, on something because everyone is so dependent upon the internet or upon their software or their hardware. Right. One of the things I, I get really sad about is when I go to like any sort of store, they have these old cash registers. They're actually like made in 2005, but they're made on technology from 1970. Yeah. And everyone has to use them, but it's awful looking. Like it, it doesn't really work, and like people are dealing with it. it it's terrible. Yeah. And yet they don't update them. And so it's not that we're not ready for, or it's not that technology is not ready for us, but we're not ready for the technology. Correct. And so how difficult would it be to, you know? 
have people change their ways and like adopt new technology. Do you well, think that that's a financial burden, or do you think it's that people just aren't ready? I mean, I know that a lot of the older generation, you know, my grandparents. No, no, you don't want to set them anywhere near that. But do you think that's a, that people are more adaptable than they think they are? Or do you think that it's a financial burden that people aren't willing to take? I think there are like three faults. I mean, one is funding, and, and two is that the technology is not designed well enough for people to intuitively be able to use it. Yeah. For instance, a hammer is extremely well designed. You pick it up, you pound on something. Right. Yeah. And if you look at the iteration of the hammer over time, it hasn't changed that much, no. ever. And so Much it's like a, a chair. Right. You sit in it. It's a great design. Here's your chair, here's your hammer. Yeah. Right? But a computer, if you look at it through time, it changes like mad. Yeah. So what does that what does that say about the design of a computer? If it has to change so much it's but, flawed. Right. And it never gets to a stable state. Maybe it will, maybe it won't, but it's just it's kind of evaporating. Its form and shape getting smaller and lighter and, and different and morphing this way. Whereas a chair is this you might fancy it up and make it look a little different, but the function is still the same. You sit on the bottom, you lean on the back, it's a chair. Right, so it's like, what does the computer do, and what is it there for, and what can it do? Yeah. And if there are too many things that it can do, then, you know, its shape changes to what can be done with it. Well, so I, I always think of, so like with a chair, we know we can sit in it. But we also know we can drag it over and stand in it to get us up higher and use a hammer to nail a Christmas ornament, right? <laughs> and computers are the same way. It, it, you know, we have a certain way we do our email with computers, a certain function like how you hit Control Alt Delete in Windows and log in, a sort, certain sort of um, way we interact with computers that is unnatural in the real world. I mean, is that some of the is that some of the kind of the research and some of the things that people are looking at is how the technology changes the human versus the human trying to do everything in the natural world with a computer. Well, that's interesting. Um, I don't know if you've heard of trilobites, but there are these like old type of creatures, and they would shed their skin, but they would also shed their eyes. And so, when they shed their eyes, they would grow new compound eyes, and they'd be able to see a lot more. So it's kind of like online, where these little creatures that filter out data and information. And when we need to, we shed our eyes and get a pair of new ones. And the pair of new ones would be an upgrade to the software that we're using, or an upgrade to the hardware that we're using, or an upgrade to understand the information we have online. And so, it's kind of that we're kind of changing it, and it's kind of changing us. And each time it changes, we act in different ways. So for instance, we're administering to our iPods, or we're administering to our computers in different ways as that technology grows and changes. I'm just thinking how wonderful it is to have a gigantic band downstairs playing. <laughs> While you know, we talk about, so is there more to talk about about Cyborg Camp? I mean, have it, we talked about who, else we need to know? who's going to be presenting oh, yeah. at Cyborg Camp? What an unconference is. Right, so an unconference. You choose what you want to talk about, and you write it down on a grid, and that's how it works. The giant post it note? A giant post it note. I freaking love giant post it notes. And that's why you don't have to worry about being constrained to a conference track, and you don't have to worry about being bored. You can leave any session choose a new session, so it's, it's useful. But this is more of a hybrid conference and conference, because you have one speaker going, right? and then you have unconference sessions as well. So we have Ward Cunningham, uh, inventor of the wiki, and he'll be speaking about um, cyborgs, which are little robots that he makes, and other things that uh, we're not supposed to know about yet. And um, Leah will be speaking about... Leah Hollander. Leah Hollander. And she's going to be giving a very interesting presentation on that. And about being a, a real life cyborg, and um, the closest thing to a cyborg right now. Right, exactly. And we'll have Bill Derushi talking about um, how technology is changing our language, mm -hmm. and he's from Ziba Design, which um, uh, DJ Hamaguchi used to be involved with, and I think still is. Mm -hmm. He's formerly of Panasonic, and now he works for Lunar which allows you to turn a web page over right on the back of it 
and send it off. Oh my gosh, that's cool. And, and what is he going to be talking about at camp? He's going to be giving two workshops on how to think. Basically, he just draws a lot of diagrams on the board and he lets you understand reality via that. He has he invented the USB dongle that allows you Wi-Fi access. Oh, very cool. Um, he's done a lot of amazing things. He's yeah. probably one of the smartest people out there. Um, really incredible. So those are our four speakers. Excellent. And then the rest is chosen by everyone who attends the conference. Well, this may very well be the shortest tech show that we've ever done. Yeah, I think it's getting a little louder in here. So we're we'll we're at a party, and we have a ton of people here. And, we and have we've a, got a band downstairs. We have a band downstairs, and we have a bunch of great guests for the After Hour show. So I think we're going <laughs> to... And I can't even hear what the audience is yelling over the band downstairs. I think they're yelling happiness and joy. Oh, yay, lovely stuff. Um, so I think we're going to say goodnight to the tech episode. And... Uh, We'll be back in just a few moments uh, with After Hours. That's right. See you later. Good night, everybody. But not you guys at the party, because we're totally not going anywhere. (laughs) 